We certainly appreciate you giving us the time. I know it's been a tough week for a lot of us. You have been right in the middle of it. And I guess one of the first things I want to do is try to establish some sort of timeline. So the first question is, when did you know that Shane Morris had suffered a concussion? Uh, I really verified that on Monday in meetings that I was having with various individuals who were involved on the sideline as part of us trying to kind of unwind all the things that happened on the sidelines and all the things that happened subsequent to the game and the evolving diagnosis process, mm -hmm. which is oftentimes, as I've now learned, typical with, with uh, concussions, um, I really kind of got informed about that during the day Monday. All right, so did Brady Hoke have any inclination that he was even being looked at for a concussion before he stood in front of the media on Monday? Um, oh, I'm sure that Brady was aware that he took a big hit because we all heard about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't see it um, real time at the game, but, but it was being covered and talked about later. Um, and I'm sure Brady is, was looking at game films. He usually does that even the evening of the game. So I'm sure he knew that Shane took a big hit. The primary health focus, as we made clear in the statement, was Shane's lower leg injury. Mm -hmm. That was the one that seemed to be the, the thing that was confusing people. And we tried to sort through that and, and organize it in the most sensible form possible in the statement that we released. But it's a complicated set of issues involving a lot of different personnel running around on a, on a stadium bench that, uh, that are managing things that are happening literally, literally in a matter of seconds. Right. I guess one of the issues that I've had, and I know a lot of other people have expressed, is how can Brady stand in front of the media on Monday, either without the information he needs about Shane having a concussion, or with the knowledge that Shane was being diagnosed yeah. or being yeah. an analyzed for a concussion? I mean, how can that happen? A huge mistake, huge gap in communication. The voice, the last voice Brady heard and the way it was positioned with him was very different than the voices that I was hearing as this thing was being reconstructed uh, on, on Monday throughout the day. And so it, it was one of the problems in communication that we need to fix. All right. So the 12.50 a.m. press release, I, that just seemed like one of the worst things you could possibly do. Did you <laughs> consider public perception when that goes out? Because it just screams news dump to me. Yeah, well, we're, we're a little smarter than thinking in today's world there's any such thing as a news dump. I mean, that's almost a little uh, offensive that we would be that naive. The, the reality was we had told folks that we were going to try to have a statement. Our objective was to have it by noon. Mm -hmm. We started meeting first thing in the morning. It became very apparent that this was far more complex and there was far more to learn than anything we were going to get done by noon. So then it became, well, mid-afternoon. Then it became late afternoon. Then it became early evening. And you need to know we weren't um, taking a lot of coffee breaks. We were in a room, and we kept getting more information, and in some cases, new and different information. We came to the conclusion we needed to meet with Shane because we thought it was important to release some specific mm -hmm. health information that, frankly, we're not even authorized to do without his permission. So now we're waiting for Shane to be able to come and sit with us. And we were dealing with some doctors and some people who were working around appointments and things that they had. And so this is a process that took a lot longer than I thought it would take. Yep. We had committed that we would have the information available that day. Mm -hmm. And we kept moving our timeline because the last thing I wanted to do is be one of those organizations that's guilty of, for the sake of speed and the fact that everybody craves information, that we release something and we find out later that it's wrong or that it's incomplete. And so we kept patiently working through the process, getting new information, and then we get done. And it's late in the evening and we get it done. And then we're sitting around the table saying, okay, we've been committing to people that we're going to get this out today. Do we all just go home and go to bed and sit on it and just release it tomorrow morning? Or do we release it as soon as we can make it available? Right. That was a judgment call. There were a lot of professionals in the room who had opinions. And the conclusion that was reached 
is this is what we know and we're prepared to announce it to the public. Let's get it out there. Uh, is that when Brady found out or did Brady know that Shane had the concussion before that at that point? Brain, Brady found out uh, earlier in the uh, evening um, because we got to the point where we felt like we needed to speak with Shane and we looped in with the coaches to find out where Shane was to get him over and that's when we engaged him in the work that had been ongoing. Okay, so now we go back to the moment that is the hit. And how is it possible for an entire coaching staff, both on the sideline and up in the booth, to not see that your quarterback just took a shot to the chin? How does that happen? Well, it's, it's very possible. First of all, it's not just the coaching staff. They're busy coaching down on the field. Their, their eyes are a lot of different places, and they don't always follow the ball like the average fan does. Oftentimes they're looking at very different things. The reality is we had numerous doctors and numerous uh, trainers down on that sidelines and nobody that we can find mm -hmm. saw that hit. It was on the far end of the field. It was a left-handed quarterback uh, setting up away from our bench. There were numerous players in the way and for people who have never been on the sidelines to watch a football game, it's the absolute worst seat in the house. Mm -hmm. I've been there, I understand. So we didn't, so we didn't see it. Up in the booth, you've got defensive coaches who are up there, and they're not even watching the offense. They're busy planning for the next series and doing what they do. And our offensive coaches up there, they're either following the ball or worrying about the next play or doing what they're doing, and they just simply didn't see it. The whole dynamic that I just described to you is the whole reason why we're implementing this eye in the sky concept. Right because after I heard about this and I listened to how this unfolded, I understand why the NFL now has that individual up there with a television screen, with a completely different perspective on the game, because in a set of circumstances like this, it's the only and best way to ensure that somebody is able to see that hit. All right, you know that in the years that he's been here, Brady has consistently had to feel the question about whether or not he should wear a headset. You being his boss and understanding that your head coach wearing a headset might have facilitated him knowing that his quarterback was in danger, no. why wouldn't you move forward and demand it's, that he wear that headset? It's absolutely not true. It's absolutely not true. The things that are being discussed by coaches on that headset had nothing to do with this situation. First of all, I'm not going to tell a coach whether to wear a headset or whether not to wear a headset. That's a coaching decision. I've asked Brady why he chooses not to wear a headset, and, and he gives me a very plausible response. He has a young man that's one step behind him the whole game that has his headset. Mm -hmm. He's listening and monitoring everything that's being said. If Brady has a question, he asks. If he wants to get on the headset, he grabs it and talks to whoever he wants to talk to. His personal view, his personal view is that if he has that headset with all the squawking in his ear, special team coaches, offensive coaches, defensive coaches, and he's worrying about monitoring all the things that are happening there. It makes him less effective at talking to the players, communicating to the players, and coaching the way he likes to coach on the sidelines. All right, so whose job is it going to be then to make sure that Brady knows in the most timely of fashions if a player shouldn't be going back in the game? Because well, there were three minutes that passed from when he got hit until when he was it's reinserted. Not, it's not a coach's job. And I, and I did want to add that in the year, Brady's first year, when we were 11 and 2, nobody mentioned anything to me about his headset practices. Interesting. Nobody cared. Now, I will tell you that the, the job of telling a coach when a player should either be taken off the field or not allowed to go back on the field rests with the medical staff. And you feel moving ahead with the new, impl the new implementations that you're well positioned to do that. I feel very comfortable the fact that we're wiring now our medical staff in such a way that they have two-way communication, real-time communication, so that regardless of how spread out they are all over the bench, regardless of who sees what or who hears what, they can communicate real-time and make sure we don't have the gap. And then the eye in the sky, I think, if we had the eye in the sky and we were seeing that replay, that slow motion replay that everybody saw, without question, there would have been a completely different method of handling the situation. Right, so Brady, now being Thursday, has had to address the public four different times. He's had two news conferences here in Ann Arbor. He did the Big Ten conference call, and today he was on 97 won the ticket. In the midst of all of this, why is he the guy who's having to field all the questions, and 
Why did it take so long for you to sit down and answer some of these questions? Because, uh, first of all, I've been busy doing things that I think are frankly more important, and that's probably not what you want to hear. Uh, but ever since we got that statement out in the wee hours, what I've been doing is connecting with our student athletes. I've traveled from team to team to team. I've caught them during practices, during meetings, because my primary responsibility is to communicate with our kids and assure them about our commitment to their health and safety and make sure they understand with the, uh, with the noise that's being made out there um, what they should understand and believe about the values of this program. I met with my faculty advisory board and had that same discussion with them. Uh, I've been doing my job, and my job is to manage this department and take care of these 931 student athletes. And once I felt that I had comfortably communicated with the people that I'm responsible for, including the 350 people who work here, because I wanted to get them in a room and discuss this and make sure they understood um, then it was time for me to do what I'm doing with you here today, and I'm quite happy to be here. You know better than anyone else that in this sport, when things are tough, the vultures start circling. Really? And people are calling for Brady Hope's job. <laughs> God, I didn't know that. Will he be the head coach at Michigan for the rest of the season? Yes. Under all circumstances? The only circumstances he wouldn't is if he conducted himself in an inappropriate way that brought discredit to the university or he knowingly, willingly broke a rule. Um, but it is not the Michigan practice and never will be as far as, uh, as, far as I believe and, and in my leadership of this department to ever do that to a program or to a group of young kids. All right. I want to say some stuff so you don't have to say it so you don't feel as though you have to defend your record because I think overall the record's pretty good. You talked about it already. Almost 1,000 student athletes, 31 teams. You've got fantastic facilities. The Student Athlete Advisory Board wrote a glowing endorsement of you on Tuesday. You cut the deal with the NHL for the Winter Classic to be here. Endorsements from big donors, uh, donations from big donors like Mr. Ross. There's, there's a lot of positives. So there are good things happening here, but there also have been a series of negative things that have happened over the course of the last few years. You look at the Brendan Gibbons case and how that was handled publicly. The fact that when Doug Nussmeyer was hired, it wasn't Brady Hoke answering the questions, it was the athletic director answering the questions, which people didn't seem to understand. The ticket prices went up for the students. And then in a case that was just on the radar last week, the promotion with Coke and the ticket giveaway that, that went wrong. So do you feel, how responsible do you feel for some of the negative press that the University of Michigan has gotten over the last year? Uh, I'm responsible for everything that happens at this department, because I'm the leader of Michigan Athletics. And so if a mistake occurs on my watch, I'm responsible. And we're, we have made mistakes. And I, 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 sad to inform you, probably, at some point in the future, we're going to make mistakes again. But what we do here at Michigan is when we make a mistake, we stand up, we take responsibility for it, we hold ourselves accountable for it, we apologize for it, and we work really hard to, to make sure we don't make the same mistake twice. And you know, there, there are some of the things you tick through here that um, you know, it, it, it's easy to, to, to set those up as a litany of mistakes, um, but each one of them has its own story, and each one of them has its own education process for the people involved to get better and make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, we're not perfect here, and there's a lot of moving pieces to 931 18 to 23 year olds mm -hmm. and 31 programs who are traveling all over the country and at times around the world and maintaining and managing all these facilities and opening these venues to the general public, there's a lot of moving parts to this. And it's a not-for-profit organization. We, we don't have a high-rise building here of, full of people. There are a lot of folks who work in tremendously long hours under a lot of pressure to keep it all going. And we're going to make mistakes. We're going to make mistakes. But they're not mistakes that are intentional. They're not mistakes of integrity. They're not mistakes of not following processes or rules. They're mistakes, and we learn from them, and we grow from them, and we move on. How about your relationship with the student body, not the athletes? You saw what happened on Tuesday night. You, you couldn't have liked that. What do you need to do to mend that relationship? Yeah, I, I think where we really got off the rails with the student body is when we really suffered a great deal of frustration three seasons ago when we sold 20,000 
tickets in our football stadium and we were getting several thousand no-shows mm -hmm. and we had these big gaping spaces and we were hearing from our student athletes and from our coaches and really some of, from a lot of our season ticket holders you know none of us liked the idea there was this big hole up there so we tried to fix a problem and we swung and we missed. We went around and talked to a lot of universities who had suffered through the same issues and they said general admission is the only answer. General admission is the only answer. Give them a motivation to get there early and that will give them the best seats. And, it'll... and we bought into it. What was the mistake we made? Well, we didn't engage with our students enough. We, we thought we had the answer and we kind of rolled out the answer and they weren't uh, as accepting to that as we thought they would be. And in the end result, we didn't solve the problem. We had just as many or almost as many open seats as we did under the old policy. So we're not brain dead here. We said, here's the mistake. We didn't get the buy-in of the student body. So we went to them and we engaged with them and we worked with the student organization and we actually had a joint release where there was endorsement for the plan that we put in place for this season. And we felt we corrected our mistake. We've got student buy-in. We've solved the problem. And, and then instead of 20,000 season tickets coming in from the students, we got 12,000. Well, isn't that about the price, though? Uh, no, I don't think it is about the price, not just the price. I think the price is always an issue. Um, but when you have 7,000 people who buy tickets and don't show up mm -hmm. and throw the tickets away, yeah. that doesn't necessarily suggest to me that they think that the price is too high. In some cases, it suggests that maybe the price is too low. But nevertheless, I think the issue that we have with trying to get a robust, filled student section is, is a significant challenge. And you see the trends nationally, and we're not the only ones dealing with this, but I don't hide behind that. We're Michigan. We've always had a very large student section, and we've always had high levels of engagement we got to get back there and and everything's on the table i told our student newspaper group earlier today everything's on the table for us to take a look at how do we get back to a place where however right size that student section is uh, we have students who show up who are part of the game day atmosphere and they help create that home field advantage that we all want uh, last one is this do you feel you have the support of the regions and the president at this stage moving forward Yes, I've not been given any reason to believe that I don't. Uh, President Schlissel has been incredibly supportive and engaged uh, and involved and, and has been a great partner in dealing with some of the issues that we've had as well as giving us an opportunity to let him see what we're all about down here. He's been down here to events. He's spoken to our coaches. He actually, he and I attended a field hockey game and he saw his first field hockey game um, he's really done a terrific job of, of working his way around and trying to get a, a clear understanding of what we're doing down here and how our work is important. All right, a lot of big things that have got to get accomplished over these next few weeks and months, so I certainly appreciate that you took the time throughout the day to meet not only with me, but with a bunch of other people. So thanks a lot. You're most welcome. All right, thank you. I really appreciate that. Just